So then, first of all, my name is, uh, is uh, Father Joseph Pfeiffer. And uh, so we, we have here the, the priests. This meeting is uh, to come together for the, to celebrate the uh, recording equipment. Uh, to celebrate the, the 25th anniversary of the consecrations of Archbishop Lefebvre, Operation Survival. And this Operation Survival, we want to consider a little bit into perspective how important, how essential this event was for each of the seven billion people that live now on earth. Remember that God created the world he said in the book of Proverbs, I am a selfish God. I have made all things for myself. God made everything for himself. Not only human beings and angels who have rational souls, who have a power of reason and free will, but he made the animals, he made the plants, he made the stars, he made the insects, he made all things for himself. And he gave reason and he gave free will to us human beings so that we could freely do what all the other creatures do by necessity. And he gave us the power to freely do what all the other creatures do by necessity so that we could get a reward. When the dog barks, when the dog bites, the dog is just being a good dog. And he's doing what he has to do to follow his instincts. When, uh, when, when a rock travels through a window and breaks the window, it's just being a good rock. Not doing anything good or bad, it's simply doing what God made it to do. Rock beats glass, rock wins, glass loses. No free will involved in the rock or the glass. But God gave human beings a free will. And now there are seven billion of them on the earth. And every one of these seven billion human beings was made to know, love, and serve God. Or St. Nature says, to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by this means to save the souls. That's why everybody was made. What is tragic about our times is that about seven billion of those seven billion people don't know that. Very few know what is obvious to the animal. Some of the fathers of the church tell us that the great miracle of Good Friday, 3 p.m., was that the earth did not rise up, and the animals did not rise up, and all the creatures did not rise up to destroy man who had killed God. And the miracle was not the earthquake. The miracle was not that the sun was darkened. The miracle was that was all that happened and that God held back the hand of nature. St. Anthony, in one of his famous sermons to the fishes, said, Oh, you fishes, outside of the city of Rimini, you fishes have no brains, you fishes have no intelligence, and yet your lack of intelligence is greater than the wisdom and intelligence of these men of Rimini. For you have no brains, and yet you know you must worship your God. And I command you to give praise to your God. And thousands of fishes praise God at the words of St. Anthony. 25 years ago, our Bishop Marcel Lefebvre did Operation Survival. It was not, as the New Angelus tells us, survival of the SSPX so that a smile can bring forth another smile. You can read that on page 71. Beautiful reading. <laughs> the beauty of a smile is that a smile brings forth another smile. That is not why Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four bishops. And if he wanted to do that, he wouldn't have consecrated this one. <laughs> church. The survival of a Catholic faith. Which faith is necessary for the salvation of every soul on earth? Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and atheists 
all know that in their hearts they must serve God. You know that about two months ago, you know that Father Hugo, myself, and Father Giselle, we are now getting more frequent flyer miles than Pope John Paul II. <laughs> and we're getting more frequent flyer miles than Father Couture, our superior agent who flies all over the planet. Because we're flying around visiting the souls. We now have about 2,000 souls going to our masses in Asia and here, and in England and Ireland. And we visit these souls calling us. And on one of the airplane trips about two months ago, I was sitting in the back of the plane, my usual seat where I sleep. And a man sat next to me, and we started talking about the crisis in the world. And he said, you know what, Father? I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But I know he's mad. <laughs>
But we have to be prudent. The magic word that is used ad nauseam in recent times. Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. There isn't anything new under the sun. The size of this crisis is greater than ever time in history, but the nature of it is not. It's souls abandoning God, only now it's on a global scale. The answer is the return to the divine, to the truth of the faith. The return to the truth expressed in the sacred liturgy, which is the Latin holy sacrifice of the Mass. The new Mass is alive. Therefore, it is an expression of the Father of lies. We must stand by the truth. And our of the Feb consecrated bishops that they might ordain priests, that they might confirm soldiers of Christ, in order that they might spread the faith. The smiling will come in heaven. We are not here to see the glory of man. And even says that in the New Angeles. The new website of the society. Wonder at the wonder at the glory of a man who serves God according to his own culture. Since when is that to speak of the society of St. Pius X, the bastion of Catholic tradition? <coughs> Operation Survival must continue. And that is why we're here today. The survival of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The survival of sacraments that are valid, the survival of the faith. And it is also glorious that we have our celebration in a tent rather than St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Partly because they've had so many sacrileges there, we wouldn't want to have it there until they remove the sacrileges and do a, 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 a removing of the desecration. Because remember, in the beginning of our church, 2,000 years ago, there was St. Peter. He was a bishop. There were 11 other bishops that were under him. And they never sat Mass in a cathedral. Ever in their lives. They never even saw a cathedral. St. Thomas built a few churches in India. They're not very beautiful. He hadn't perfected the design yet. St. Thomas built them. One of them is still standing in the tip of India. But he built little churches. St. Thomas was able to. Most of the apostles, other apostles were not. They came to build the faith. They said mass in people's houses, the apostles did. They said mass in tabernacles and tents, the apostles did. And they went to conquer the world. They were obeying the command of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28. Going therefore, teach ye all nations whatsoever I have taught you. That's what we teach. It is that which makes the Catholic Church different from all the false Protestant churches and the new church in Celia Rome. They teach whatsoever they like of Jesus Christ. They teach whatsoever pleases them in the teaching of Jesus Christ. They twist his teaching. But Catholics are those who teach whatsoever he taught. It doesn't matter that we are few. That doesn't matter. The truth is power. The truth will bring victory. And Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four bishops to publish the truth to the world. Consecrated four bishops in order to make priests who would be priests that are anti-liberal, anti-modernists, priests that are warriors, Priest is a captain in the army of God. There's no use joining the army unless you like war. And St. Paul tells us that we are all at war. We are at war now. And our fight is against principalities and powers. I remember when our Bishop of Feb consecrated those bishops, it was a major blow. We could say it was the second greatest major blow against the devil in the 20th century. The first major blow was St. Pius X. Pashendi, the anti-modernist oath, teaching of catechism to children, giving Holy Communion to little children. St. Pius X knew, because he was a pastor, 
because he had gone through all the steps of the hierarchy unlike any pope before him. He knew that if you want to defeat the devil, you must be as little children. And the best that behave as little children are little children. And therefore, teach little children. He commanded that in every church, St. Pius X wrote ten encyclicals on catechism, he commanded that in every church there must be the teaching of the catechism. Who made you? God made you. We're speaking to some of the children here today, giving them their new catechism lessons according to New Society of St. Pius X. Who made you? God made me. No, no. Who made you? I don't know. I trust the priest. <laughs> Why did God make you? I don't know. I trust the priest. <laughs> One of my duties of the last eight years in the society was visiting no sort of priests and bishops. I visited more than 300 priests, more than 20 bishops. Many of those priests told me, I said, what do you believe, Father? Do you want to know what I believe? Yes, I want to know what you believe. Do you want to know what I believe? Yes, what I believe. Go to the chancery. <laughs> the bishop will tell you what I believe. One of them said, come back and let me know. <laughs> so they believe whatever comes out of the mouth of the bishop. What is very disconcerting, Father Thieman, good young priest, gave a talk, The Resistance to What, on April the 16th in, in St. Mary's, Kansas. Unfortunately, because of his busy schedule as a seminary professor, I guess he had little time to study what the resistance is teaching before he gave the talk on the resistance. But one of the things that he says in that talk is, read Lumen Gentium number 25. There is nothing wrong with Lumen Gentium number 25. How can any Catholic have a problem with Lumen Gentium number 25? And yet these resistance priests are complaining about Lumen Gentium number 25. Lumen Gentium number 25 says, we must believe whatever comes out of the mouth of the bishop. So whatever the bishop expressed with a firm will. So if the bishop says, I want you to believe with a firm will that these walls are purple, then we have to believe they're purple. And since you have to believe whatever the bishop teaches, you better know what diocese you're in. Because when you switch dioceses, you have, a, I believe it's purple, but when I cross over this wall, that's the other diocese here, it's green. No, oh, it's purple. Here it's green. <laughs> Some bishops believe the death penalty is bad. Other bishops believe that it's good. And they preach it with a firm will. So which do you believe? Well, it depends on what diocese you're in. According to Lumen Gentium number 25. No reference to the deposit of the faith. St. Paul said, If an angel from heaven teaches you something different than what I have taught you, let him be anathema. This presupposes that you can know what St. Paul taught. You can know what the church teaches. You're supposed to memorize that catechism. And St. Pius X said, Heresies spread not because of smart heresiarchs, but because Catholics don't know their faith. If you come in here ignorant of the 20th century, ignorant technology, you can come in and I'll say, I'm a very powerful man. I have the power of the gods. Watch. Light switch up. See? Light came from me. Wow, I believe that. Why? Because you're ignorant of the electricity. <laughs> but if you know electricity, I can come and say, well, I made the light turn on. You can say, no, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so by having the knowledge of the truth, you overcome the errors. That is why St. Pius X did not only write an encyclical against modernism called Vashindi, he commanded that the little boys and little girls know who made you. God made me. I have to check with the bishop. <laughs> so that when a Catholic bishop or a Catholic priest stands in the pulpit and says there are many gods, you say, forget it. We have one catechism test in India. One of our boys that we actually baptized, the Hindus. And Father Couture said, okay, I'm going to test with you a little Anakit. So how many gods are there? There are many gods. He said, no, there's only one. Okay, no problem. Only one. <laughs> we have a good catechism program. <laughs> so, we need to have a slightly deeper knowledge than that. If we really know the number of gods, then someone comes and tells you that there's more than one, you tell them, go get lost. We have to know our faith. 
And Operation Survival was about spreading the knowledge of the faith. And one of the things that it did, it didn't only spread the knowledge of the faith to the society of St. Pius X, it spread the knowledge of the faith to our enemies. Because they had to research what these guys are saying. And they had to try to make up some kind of an attack against the society. Still very small. 560 priests visiting some dioceses where there are more priests than that in one single diocese. There are 60,000 priests in India alone. It's good money being a priest over there. A lot of corruption. But there's 60,000 priests. Only one country. We have four. Four priests in that same country. And they fight against us. In every diocese, the Hindu is no problem. But the Catholics fight against us. And they are terrified of us. We come into the diocese once in a month, once in two months. Say Mass for 25, 30 people in a hotel or in someone's house. And the bishop makes a firm excommunication. The bishop is terrified. And he should be terrified. Because the truth will always destroy lies. And the truth is the only enemy of lies. You do not defeat lies with another lie. Lies and heresy are only defeated by the truth. What is necessary for us is to maintain that truth, stand firmly on that truth, live by that truth, be ready to die for the sake of that truth, and do everything we can to spread that truth. That's to be one holy Catholic and apostolic. Every Catholic is obliged to that. Priests more, bishops more, Pope more. But this is the obligation of every Catholic. We find a tragedy on one side, and here we are 25 years after the consecration, and the four bishops who were consecrated merchants of the Fed find one here, three somewhere else. We should all four be together. Why, what, what unites them? What well, unites the society of St. Pius X? Where is the strength of the society? Anyone who has any experience with the SSPX knows that we have no organization and we do everything wrong. That's just the way it is. It's always been that way. We are not gifted in organization. We try to use red tape, but it's the wrong kind of red, it's the wrong kind of ink, and the tape sticks, it doesn't work. The SSPX was not designed for red tape. The SSPX was not designed for the modern idea of nobility. The SSPX was not designed for these things. It was designed for priests who have the faith to go in, do everything wrong, and yet it works because they have the faith. But what happened was, over the last 40 years, especially the last 18 years, the SSPX priest began to look at himself rather than his God. He began to look at his own self and his own comfort and his own greatness rather than the purpose of the priesthood, which is to suffer for souls and to be a victim for the good of the salvation of souls. Arsene Lefebvre, when his little boy, wanted to be a priest for the salvation of souls. And he wanted to go to Africa. And he wanted to be a missionary. To save souls. God the Son became man to save souls and bring them back as a treasure to his father. He has more liking for Vikings than for modern men. At least the Vi Vikings go in. Cap they didn't like capturing cities. They went and captured gold. They brought it back. And Jesus Christ was like a Viking. He came down to go into this world, to fight in it, to conquer souls, and not to establish a heaven on earth, but to bring those souls back to heaven. That is why we call to this day the tabernacle. We must make Christ reign here below so that we can bring all souls to their true home, which is in heaven. And every soul has to go to heaven. We are in a global fight. It is exceedingly important that we are here. It is exceedingly important that we stand firm with the faith. We have with us some, some uh, Father Thomas Aquinas, who will be a little talk a little bit later on. Coming from the Brazil, coming from Brazil, Benedictine Monastery in Brazil. We have Father Joachim, the monastery of the family of the Blessed Virgin Mary. His superior, Father Jahir, was not able to come. He's 76 years old, 
but he sent Father Joachim instead. And Father Joachim is here, it's a family of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And Father Jair, the superior of that monastery in Brazil, 12 very strong monks, a beautiful monastery built from nothing. They're true warriors for Christ. But Father Jair told me that after the council, he was a young priest at that time, and he told me that I saw after the council that the church is unstable, that the church is changing. And so I had a kind of, it wasn't a vision, but an inspiration. The inspiration to found an order which would take a fourth vow, besides poverty, chastity, and obedience, a vow of stability. This is the vow we are taking in the Society of St. Pius X today, a vow of stability. Not the, the vow of stability, the old vow by which you stayed in the same monastery until you died, but a new vow of stability, which he said, the vow of stability of faith. He said, let the church change. Let the men change. Let them all change. But I will take a vow of stability of faith. And I will not maintain that stability unless I have Mary and the rosary. And so they said the 15 seconds of the rosary every day. And Father Pierre told me, our magisteri is built on Mary. It is built on the rosary. It is built on the stability of the faith. And this is the only thing that preserves us. This is the answer to our crisis. We must preserve the stability of faith. And in the new society of St. Pius X, the faith is dead. There are still good men. There are good men everywhere. We do not judge souls. But they are teaching modernism. They are teaching confused truth when they do teach truth in such a way that you will not get it. Read the New Angelus on the 25th anniversary of the consecrations of Archbishop of Lefebvre. These are consecrations are very important, Operation Survival, for the survival of the society of St. Pius X. Absolute foolishness. The Jesuits were founded by St. Ignatius, and they had many saints. They were more worthy of survival than the SSPX. But in 1741 or 1739, or whatever year it was, that they suppressed the Jesuits, the Pope unjustly suppressed the Jesuits. He did it as an act of wickedness. The Jesuits obeyed. They did not survive. They did not do an operation survival. Why? We see the effects of that act in India, where I was a priest for four years. We see the effects of that act in the Philippines. Many souls were damaged because the Jesuits had to leave. But they left. Why did they leave? Because they were Augustinians, they were Recollectos, they were Dominicans, they were Franciscans, they were Capuchins, there were many other orders that had the faith and could take their place, and therefore they left, and they allowed themselves to be suppressed. The SSPX has no right to preserve the SSPX. The whole consecration of the four bishops in 1988 was not Operation Survival for the SSPX, it was Operation Survival for the Catholic priesthood. It was Operation Survival or the Catholic Faith. There was no other bishop in the Catholic Church teaching the integral Catholic faith in 1988. And there isn't today in 2013 either. There was no other bishop having a Catholic seminary following all the traditions of the Catholic seminaries of the last 2,000 years and the instruction of the, of the spirit of the priests. Teaching an integral faith without compromise anywhere on planet Earth. And the church needs priests who don't have compromise. If it needed intelligent priests, 90% of us would never have been ordained. But the church doesn't need intelligent priests, though there must be some. Some there must be. The church needs priests who are warriors of faith, who are ready to die for the souls, who feel the need of souls, Archbishop Lefebvre was called in South America. He was called here in the United States. He was called in Asia. He was called all over Europe. And he went everywhere. Only a few seminarians, nine of them the first year. Only a few priests, some of them very shaky, very weak. But within a couple of years, he already had priests more or less everywhere in the world. 
And so it is necessary to continue that work. The time will come when Our Lady allows the persecution to come back. It has always come to the church, it will come again. When that time comes, we ask the grace to persevere through that persecution. But we must continue as loyal sons of the Holy Archbishop. One 93-year-old priest in India told me, he is now 93 years old, Father Xavier Ignatius, when he was a young lad, when he was 90, <laughs> a few years ago, he went on a train to do the mass circuit. And then we travel on the trains in India, and there's a, there's a sleeping car, so there's a lower bunk, middle bunk, and a top bunk. So he was there in the lower bunk, and a man said, Can you let my father sleep on the bottom bunk? Can you climb to the top bunk? Because my father is 65. <laughs> so he climbed up to the top bunk. They don't have ladders there. They don't have security things that we do. You just climb up and hope for the best. So he climbed up and got on the top bunk, and he said, You know how old I am? He said, what? 90. Do you want to come back down? He goes, No, it's nice up here. So <laughs> Father Xavier Ignatius told me that when he was ordained a priest 65 years ago, his 60th anniversary was great because I think we had about 10 60th anniversary celebrations. So he had several years of 60th anniversary celebrations. So I don't know exactly what year he was ordained because we had many 60th anniversary celebrations. But nonetheless, he's about 62 or 63 years of priest now. When he was ordained a priest, he had 17 missions where he used to say Mass. Newly ordained priest. Travel on the ox cart between those missions, going to save souls. Every month he would go around those 17 missions. And he told me, by the time 1984 came along, 1985, he was on the verge of giving up everything. He was so discouraged at how bad the church had become. He was so discouraged at everything. And then two young priests came from the Society of St. Pius X. And came to South India, where he was, and still is. And he heard about Archbishop Marcelo Fed. And he told me, I am, I am 90 years old. When I first met him, he was 80, 80, early 80s. I'm 80 years old. And my priesthood was saved by Archbishop Marcelo Fed. The same is true of many other old priests. He was affected. And he kept his priesthood. Another priest I was stationed with, Father Ronald Bebo, he was thinking about leaving the priesthood in 1988. He could not take the new Mass anymore. He was only allowed to say the Latin Mass once a month. And he says, I said, I can't take it anymore. And then there was a news, excommunicated archbishop. He said, if he's excommunicated, he can't be that bad. <laughs> so he looked into the excommunicated archbishop. And then Father, and then, and then he joined the Society of St. Pius X and is still helping us to this day. Now he's 75 or 76 years old. Many other priests who are not members of the Society of St. Pius X, they found their encouragement, they have found their strength, they have found their hope through the work of our children, our children Marcel de Pez. This work must continue. And it will continue by the grace of God. We are not here in order to celebrate only a 25th anniversary. We are here to continue a fight. We are here to spread the faith. We are here to conquer the world for Christ. And we know that we are not able to do it. But by the grace of God it shall come. And we also recognize that in this particular crisis, though we have to fight, though we have to run to the ends of the earth to spread the kingdom of Christ, we also recognize that we cannot win and we cannot succeed and that the victory will only come by the hands of Mary. This victory, which when you look at the new publications in the Society of St. Pius X, is absent. It's absent. Mary is not mentioned anymore. Almost never. Fatima is forgotten. Oh, it's just a private revelation. Tell that to her son when you die. 
It is not just a quote unquote private revelation. When we use the word private, we only distinguish it from the public revelation, which is the revelation given by God to the apostles, which ended in the death of the last apostle. But the revelation that was given to, by Our Lady to our earth was for all of us. Public, not public in the sense of the, the, the second for the scripture and tradition, but public in the sense that it is for all men. These theologians know what we mean by the word private revelation. They're not fools, and they twist the meaning of the word. Our Lady appeared for us. Fulfill your duty of state. Say your rosary. Stay faithful to the faith. And have confidence in the grace of God. He will send you priests. Like Father Giselle said in one of our first sermons, we began this resistance movement last year, two priests and one faithful in the Philippines. I've been mentioned many times. The faithful of my secretary, she was only there because I forced her to be there or else I would kill her. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there it spread. And now we have more than 2,000 going to our masses in eight months' time. People calling us from everywhere. My father said in one of the little sermons, says, you, don't worry, God will never leave you without a priest. If you need a priest, he will give it to you. Father Cummins, an old wise priest, in the, who has now died in, in Australia. He was saying Mass in the far reaches of Australia in a place called Streaky Bay, in the middle of nowhere. Kangaroos don't even go there. And only 20, 25 people at the Mass. And he was saying Mass in the 70s or so on, back in the 1970s. And the, you know, a young priest said, look at that old bag of bones. What are you going to do when he dies? How are you going to survive? And they said, I don't know, but God will provide, and he did. One of the old ladies asked Father Cummins, says, Father, how am I going to be anointing? How am I going to die? You're traveling all over Australia, traveling thousands of miles everywhere. What if, what, what, how am I going to get the sacraments? And Father Cummins said, my experience has been that whenever I'm needed, I'm not very far away. God knows when we're needed. Says when we consecrate a church, or rather, one of the things we say about the priest, that wherever I am, there my minister will be, it says in the sacred scripture. Wherever I am, there my minister will be. So if Christ is in us, the minister will come. And a very holy priest in England back in the 1880s preached a, preached a series of sermons on the call, the coming of Christ the King, about the end of the world, by the Coleridge. And he said, Christ gave us two signs at the end of the world. And he said, when the Son of Man comes, it shall be like lightning coming from the east into the west. And he said, this is a public sign. Everyone can see lightning. When the Son of Man comes, it shall be like lightning from the east into the west. And this is in order to remind us that when we hear Christ is in the desert, go ye not out. He is in the closets, believe it not. Christ will come in power and majesty. That's the first warning. And that will be the first sign. That's the end of the world. But then Christ in his gentleness, as Father Coleridge, gives us a second sign. And that is, for where the body is, there the eagles shall gather together. And this is the secret sign. And Father Coleridge says in his sermon in 1883, he says, Travelers in the desert, in the great Sahara, have noted how when a camel is dying in the desert, the camel is dying, and there are no birds in the sky, neither in any direction, there is not a single bird. But before the camel draws his last breath, the eagles have gathered together. God has given a special sense to the eagles. And notice he says the eagles, and not the buzzards. For the buzzards will not receive this sense. But the eagles will receive the sense, and this is to encourage souls of the end times. For in the end times, there will be very few priests. In the end times, you may not see a priest for weeks or months or even years. And you may not even know where the priest is. But God will give a sense. 
He will give us sense. For he gave a secret sense to the eagles. Can he not give a supernatural and sacred sense to souls that love him in the end times? We are in those times now. Whoever I am, my minister will be. Have faith. Keep Christ in your hearts. The minister will come. Wherever the body is, the eagles will gather together. And he says, this body, he says, Father Coleridge, is the body of Christ. And notice it is his dead body, for his living body does not attract souls. The living body of Christ was a failure, says Father Coleridge. For the living body of Christ taught the apostles. The living body of Christ taught all of the disciples, and 100% of them abandoned him on Good Friday. So his living body was not very successful. But his dead body, if I be lifted up upon the cross, I will draw all things to myself. <coughs> Bishop Williamson has experienced great crosses in recent years. His foolishness about the denying the only dog that matters in our times. You cannot deny the Holocaust. We don't deny the Holocaust. The true Holocaust happens on our altar every day. Every day, the Holocaust happens on our altars. The burning up of the victim, the salvation of souls. Our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. We find that today, speaking even simple truths, you are condemned. Persecution comes in mockery. But our Lord Jesus Christ says in the Old Testament, when the end of the world comes and the souls are burning in hell, God shall mock. He shall be the last one that shall mock. He said, I shall mock when that which comes upon you which you feared. But in any case, we are here to celebrate this Operation Survival. Not the survival of ourselves. We don't need to survive. What is necessary is that Christ's faith survives in this world. And if we can die to spread that faith, there is no greater honor, no greater glory. St. Thomas More, or rather St. Thomas, yeah, St. Thomas More told his daughter Meg, she was visiting him in the Tower of London. She was weeping, and she was telling her father, you shouldn't die. You don't have to make a great compromise, just a small one. And while she was speaking to him, three Carthusians were on the way to be martyred. And they were not noblemen like Thomas More, therefore he would only be beheaded. They were going to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And they were dragged out. And Thomas More could see them out the door and he said, Look, man, look out the window and see. You see those three monks? See how joyful they are? See how gloriously happy they are? See how they sing? As though they are going to their wedding. And they went to be martyred. One of them, when his heart was cut out, the executioner cut out his heart. He handed it to him before he was dying. And he held his own heart in his hands. And his last words were, Lord, What will you do with my heart? We are in an age in which we need men with hearts who are ready to pull them out and give them to the executioner. We are ready to go into battle and die for our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not afraid of the attacks of the modern world. We are going to stand strong for the faith and we are going to condemn the errors and we will do it with joy and confidence. We need saints. And saints cannot be had without divine truth. That is why the devil wants men to be homosexuals and women to be like men. Because no man can become a saint if he is not a man. A woman can become a saint if she is not a woman and not a lady.
you need to pray for your priest, Father Hannon, my old pastor, which flows here, he used to say, you get the priest that you deserve. You deserve a stable priest. We've got the most stable priest in the world, Father Ray Rose. Thank you. 